Uh, I found Alfred Korzybski a stimulating and uh, effective teacher. Let me show you an example of one of his uh, instructional tricks. You take a matchbox and say, now, watch. You see it drop. What do you call this? Well, a very primitive man who experienced this uh, in the form of uh, maybe landslides or an animal jumping down on him or a rock falling down on him. This could be evil spirits. And with evil spirits, you have to have some system for placating them. Maybe medicine men, witchcraft. If it doesn't work, don't question the system. Just kill the old one and get a better medicine man or practice better witchcraft. Uh, but went along, eventually someone said, no, these aren't evil spirits, they're gods. Well, if they're gods, let's worship them. We can build temples, nice architecture. Uh, no, eventually someone says, no, these aren't gods. This is a force. Well, if it's a force, let's measure it. And they are with mathematics and the making of perhaps various kinds of machinery. Someone else observing it says, no, this isn't a force, it's gravity. Well, if it's gravity, new mathematical formula, new perspectives about the world we live in. Someone else looks at doesn't say anything. He writes four and a half pages of mathematical uh, equations, Einstein theory. And does that affect our lives? It changes them to the core. And so how do we interpret some simple events, which may not be that simple, makes a big difference in what the world we live in may turn out to be. As long as I have this matchbox here, let me tell you of another instructional ploy that Korzybski used. I did not see this one, but he told us about it. Uh, he had been repeated, uh, uh, he had been invited repeatedly as a uh, guest lecturer to, uh, to a fashionable girls' school. And uh, when he came there, he was greeted by uh, person in charge and said, you know, we have a particular problem. We have a girl in the school who has good potential, but she will not settle down and she argues about everything. She'll, uh, and sh she's very difficult to deal with. And she always wants to be first. That's the important. Anything she wants to be, I'm it. I'm first. So Krasovsky decided to handle this uh, in the following way. When he, instead of giving the usual lecture, he said he would like to have a sort of round table on the stage and uh, have a lecture at the times, address the people in the audience, sometimes uh, relate uh, the audience to the people with him on the stage, peers of members of the audience. And he made it a point to invite this particular girl. And he seated her right next to him, which pleased her a great deal. And she was just beaming up there. He took out his uh, cigarettes. He used to smoke wings, by the way, which are the cheapest cigarettes around at the time, 10 cents a package. And uh, no pretense about AK. But he used a, a long cigarette holder and he put the cigarette in and sometimes he just put it down the cigarette and the cigarette holder in. So it, what he did, he put, put down the cigarette and cigarette holder and he put a box of matches like this. You know, and uh, proceeded to lecture and then put the cigarette to his mouth and as he went to light it, this girl who wanted, who's been invited, felt so good about it, she wanted to be helpful, she grabbed the box of matches and opened up the light of cigarette. But the box was empty. She was furious. She says, who ever heard of people carrying empty matchboxes? And all Krasipsky said to her was, uh, the world is a bigger place than ever you can imagine. And he went on lecturing 
He got rid of that and he pulled out another box of matches. He put it down and put down a cigarette and he went after a little bit. He started to light up again. Well, the girl again took the matches. Only this time, she shook them. Yeah, they're matches. So she felt, okay, she opened them up and all the matches were burnt. So she was furious again. She felt and made a fool of herself. Whoever heard of people carrying match boxes with, it, with uh, burnt matches in them? My parents wouldn't do anything like that. My parents also so. And he said, the world is a much bigger place than your family or your parents uh, than anything you can imagine. And she sat there. He got rid of that box. He pulled out another box and put it down there. And he was, uh, he did the same thing. And then after a little bit, he went to light a cigarette. The girl was a little more gingerly picked up the box of matches. She was quite compulsive, you see. But she shook them and there wasn't a sound. So she smiled and put it down. And he went to another minute, so he took the matches and forced the box open. He had just jammed this particular box with matches so it wouldn't wrap. And after he jammed, he took out a match, lighted the cigarette, put it down, never said a word, neither did the girl. And that was the end of that. He says that uh, he got back reports later, not a miracle, but it did make a difference. A delayed reaction took place in her. She began to delay some of her reactions, and uh, she apparently did much better. Now, uh, Korzybski's uh, seminars and teaching were very much to the point as far as I was concerned, and he required a lot of reading. I'm not saying that we read everything he recommended, but most of the recommendings, uh, recommendations were heavy, uh, considered heavy reading. Most of them were in mathematics, biology, and physics. Uh, he felt certain scientific formulations were absolutely essential, especially the Einstein relativity theory. And he made it a point to present to us the focal point of the special, not the general relativity theory. He made a most clear presentation of it. I can repeat it understandably to students when I lecture. And I promise uh, to hold for most of his presentation. And he dealt with some uh, quite uh, challenging topics. I always say I'm really dealing with the ABCs of science. But science is a fundamental, bi fundamental bias, and as science changed, so did general semantics, as far as he's concerned. Now, uh, in his teaching, the science, having us learn about the Einstein relativity theory and some of the newest findings in biology, as I say, and uh, in mathematical formulations, uh, he uh, dealt with uh, other aspects of human behavior. He would make the point that uh, man is a definition, Smith one is a fact, but even that is really a fiction and that you and I are fictions because we don't exist in the abstract. We exist in an environment. They talked about the hyphen. It's Smith hyphen environment. And uh, this has of course a lot of uh, ramifications and uh, a lot of derivatives, which uh, we dealt with in the seminar. And these seminar sessions would last anywhere from about 5.30 to 11 at night or in that neighborhood. I would like to read you the uh, opening comments of the very first session of the seminar. June 22, 1942. Individual ability to take care of oneself is a prerequisite to taking care of a group in situations of group reaction. Brains differ functionally, not physiologically. Problem of teaching is to educate, develop efficient people that can carry their own nervous systems. And we in the seminar are involved in an unorthodox methodology, first theory, then practical application. We are out to get results training to apply the theory. We are living in a period when all the theoretical issues are unclear. This is a period of hypertension, blood pressure, example, many theories of education, but none fits the facts. Uh, I mentioned 1942 because it might sound as if this were 
things spoken today. I found a number of Korzewski's insights quite, uh, shall we say, almost inspiring and uh, over a period of time impressive. At the end of the seminar, uh, he said, you know, we have a fundamental bias with science. We have bi general semantics changes as science changes. And he said, if this is as good as I think it is, it ought to be good for the next 50 years. So uh, he didn't have a megalomaniac picture about this. Uh, I've heard stories about Korzybski's uh, personality, and I know he was quite blunt, and I've seen him quite blunt. I liked it about him. He was direct. He was a practical man. Uh, at one point, I was leaving Chicago, and he was there in Chicago at the time. I graduated from the University of Chicago, and I was going to go to the Juilliard School of Music and apply to live at International House. I needed the recommendation of two professors. Korzybski was one of the references I gave. Korzybski didn't write them. He wired them. That helped. I got uh, I was accepted in short order. Uh, while I was in New York, I received a letter from Korzybski saying that he was coming to present a seminar in New York City. And that would be one over a period of some time. And he invited me to be his guest that without fee, he said, you know, you know, as a student, I wouldn't have money. And he suggested I get in touch with W. Benton Harrison and the arranger. So I did that. The seminar was held in one of the uh, uh, civic buildings. Uh, it looked like a very large courtroom. It was quite comfortable. Anyhow, when I arrived for the seminar, uh, Korzybski was sitting at a table. He called me over and he asked me, oh, sorry, when I was leaving uh, for New York, he said, what are you going to do about beans? I said, what do you mean? He says, well, you've got to eat. He says, oh, oh it's all right. So he uh, called over Charlotte and asked her to bring him his files. And he gave me some names and addresses of people I could contact in this name. Now, I'm not much for coming and asking people, you know, what can you do for me? Uh, so I didn't follow up on it, although I did go to the uh, chapter meetings and uh, did meet interesting people and had some interesting times with them. So when Korzybski asked me if I'd seen so-and-so and so-and-so, -and -so, I started to say, no, I hadn't yet about some of them, and I started to alibi. He had no patience for alibis. He just waved me away, didn't want to hear another word, and he never spoke to me again for the rest of the, uh, the seminar throughout all the sessions, which was most unusual because we had a very uh, good relationship. You know, he was like a grandfather as far as I was concerned. At the end of the seminar, all the members of the group went up on a podium to have a picture taken as a group. I sat back at the other end of the uh, room. He looks out and he says, Clay, what are you doing out there? And I said, what do you mean? He says, oh, he says, oh, forget it. Come on up here. And that was the end of that. Uh, I found him to be not only direct, but not pretentious and a man of integrity. One did not have to agree with everything he said to, uh, to understand him. Let me give you uh, one other incident that impressed me particularly. At the founding dinners of the Society, uh, Society for General Semantics held in Chicago, uh, this was in the 42-1943 period, uh, we were gathered in one of the large hotel uh, uh, tells at one of their banquet rooms, and Hayakawa was there, and Irving J. Lee, and uh, a number of other academics and uh, other people of uh, high visibility in their fields, as well as a number of people like myself, young and uh, students and uh, people who just uh, met the responsibilities of their lives. Well, during the 
course of discussions from the floor and points being made and questions asked, uh, Korzybski was seated. Korzybski was seated at the head table. A number of people with him. As usual, he was dressed in his well-pressed khakis and open collar shirt. Although many of us are dressed quite, uh, you know, business suit and tie and nicely dressed for the occasion. There was one young man who stood up and a number of times, and when he spoke, he did not speak uh, as a person who had the greatest opportunity for academic polish, but he had things to say that mattered. He was dressed in uh, semi-working clothes with a tie and uh, neat. But Krasipsky questioned him and he asked him how, who he was and where he came from. And he said he had hitchhiked up from Texas. Now these are depression years. Uh, so Krasipsky uh, asked him what it is. He said, I'm an auto mechanic. And he looked, you could see Greasy had never gotten off his hands totally. And Krasipsky asked another question he responded to him succinctly and to the point said, why don't you come up here and sit by me here at the head table? And that invitation was not extended to uh, Hayakawa, who was sitting out there in the audience with a few others. It was, uh, or Lee and uh, someone from Northwestern University, a doctor whose name slips me for the moment. But uh, I must admit, something about the man appealed to me. And, uh, and this was one of the incidents in point. I learned about the seminar from Gordon McKnight, a friend and a University of Chicago student. Uh, he uh, had become interested in science and sanity, and as a result, I had perused some of the quot quotations in it. As we talked, uh, I realized that uh, here was someone dealing with uh, issues and dealing with them in ways that were quite, in, uh, quite central to the way uh, we, were, uh, we were involved and concerned with intellectual life at the time. And the man seemed to be an independent thinker. So uh, I went to the seminar and hoping to expand the uh, intellectual horizons, maybe get some verifications for some ideas uh, of the had, but uh, that's as far as I think I, I could say. So essentially it was word of mouth. 